If you would go to Luke chapter 22, would you do that? Join me in Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Luke 22. And let's look at verses 7 through 16. All right, Luke 22, if you're there, say amen. Awesome. Look at Luke 22, starting in verse 7. Just look at this with me. Then came the day of uh, unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou uh, that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when you are entered in the city, there shall uh, a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water, follow him into the house where he entered then. And he shall say unto the good men of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room. So you've heard that statement in the upper room. This is the story behind it. This is where it took place. And it was furnished and there make ready. Then verse 13, And they went and found, uh, as he has said, and uh, obviously uh, we know that the Lord had prepared that, and it happened just as he said. Then verse 14, if you would, and when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. So we know everyone's there. Okay, the whole entourage is there. Verse 15, he said to them, With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Uh, he's already telling them, guys, it's a matter of time now. Man, this is leading right up to where Christ is crucified, or at least goes before the council, and goes before Pilate, and goes before uh, 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 all of them, and, he, and he's accused and uh, this goes before his beating, and this goes before uh, the torment and the trial, uh, which we was falsely accused, but the, the, the mock trial, as you would, and uh, leading up to the crucifixion. And notice verse 16, For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof, until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. This is it, guys. This will be the last one. And he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, guys. Would you take this and, and pass it around, if you would? For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And then he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. That looks awfully familiar. We find that in 1 Corinthians 11, which we'll go to in just a moment. Likewise, all the, also the cup after sup saying, which means after uh, supper, uh, after he gave thanks for that as well. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. Now we know leading up to this, he, he, he's already talked about and mentioned that Judas... And he doesn't call his name out specifically, but we know it's him because we have the entire word, written word of God. In the last moments, the last days, the last moments with Christ, uh, you have someone who betrays him and someone who denies him. And notice Jesus says, And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. Jesus is there preparing and this is the final Passover with them. Yet there was an indication that Christ's earthly ministry uh, obviously fell under the Old Testament law of Moses because he says, look, uh, uh, this, this is significant and this is why we're doing this and, and I'm, I'm preparing for the crucifixion before I suffer. And even during this time, we learn next on the timeline through Christ's earthly ministry in this final week that the Passover was eaten and taken but then they're jealously rebuked. Rebuke. Do you remember what happened there? They're all eating and Jesus is pointing out betrayal and then while they're all there you've got everyone leaning in and what's the question that they ask Jesus during the final moments during this intimate time that he's sharing with them and the significance of the cross and his body being broken and his blood being shed for the remission of sins. And what's the question that they ask? What is it, church? Who's going to be the greatest? 
I mean, hey, that's important, man. Jesus, we hear what you're saying, but we just dying to know which one of us is going to be the greatest after all. I'm treasurer. Maybe that's what Judas said. I don't know. Hey, uh, I, I left the fishing boats for you, Jesus. I gave up a lot. Maybe Matthew, who was a tax collector. Hey, I left, up a, I left a good job making good money. I don't know if they said that. I don't know. I don't know what was in their heart. I can't read that, but I do know this. Something wasn't right because they asked the wrong question. Jesus rebuked them for it. And then we leave that scene and we find Jesus robing himself with a servant's robe. And what do you find? You find Jesus, he washes their feet. You, you find him feet washing. Which is so significant about the Son of Man not coming to be ministered to, but to minister. Hey, Jesus said, if you want to be great, Want to be first, be last. How you like that math? Well, the first one shall, the last one shall be first, and the first shall be last. Uh, Jesus don't know what economy you're on, but that's kind of backwards. But Jesus knew the real deal. Jesus said, "Listen, the greatest of you is a servant, and I'm going to be a servant, and I'm going to be an example to you what you should do." Then we notice in, uh, along this line in the same event, the same timeline, that Judas is revealed and defects. And Jesus says to the twelve, One of you shall betray me. Christ revealed that to the group. He says, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, that's the guy. Boy, how personal intimate this was Jesus by the way even warns of further desertion and uh, look at Matthew 26 if you'd back up I'd like for you to look at Matthew 26 here's what's astonishing and Pastor Tom and I were talking about this today as, as he and I were kind of along the same line of what we're teaching leading up to Easter and, and uh, we, we heavily discussed the communion and the Passover and the Lord's Supper and table and all that those words are used interchangeably a lot. And, and how even Jesus at this moment, man, you're going to betray me. Some of you are going to deny me. But, but I want you to know, um, that's probably not where it's going to stop. Many of you are going to do that. And notice in Mark chapter 26, Matthew, excuse me, Matthew, look at verse 21. Matthew 26, look at verse 21. And they were exceeding sorrowful and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? Hey, hey guys, some of you, some of you are going, you're just going to betray me. One of you is going to do that. And so naturally the question begins, well, is it me? Is it me? I want to know, is it me? And notice Jesus' answer. He dipped his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The son of man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? Boy, look at here. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said. Yep. It's you. It is you. How, how interesting that we see here of the desertion that's about to take place and, and the betrayal. But then, here's what Jesus even says to Peter. Would you look at verse 31? Just drop down to there. Same chapter. Then Jesus said unto him, All you shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. We know. Christ is going to get crucified, and where do the disciples go? They go and hide. You guys, you're going to, you guys are going to take off like a scared rabbit. But after I am risen, I will go before you in Galilee. You're going to see me again, guys. You're going to be a witness of the resurrection. Verse 33, Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended, 
because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Did Peter deny him yes or no? Peter stuck his foot right in his mouth. Peter said, and uh, Jesus said unto him, verse 34, Verily I say unto, you, unto thee, hey Peter, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me three times. You're going to do it thrice. You're going to deny me three times, Peter. Peter said unto him, <laughs> Before I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. Boy, Jesus is warning them and warning them. And then we come to the Lord's Supper. And you're here in Matthew 26, just by way of review. Would you look at verses 26 through 29? Let's look at it. And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and blessed it, break it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You know what's interesting? I'd like for you to turn now to 1 Corinthians 11. I'd like to spend the remaining of our time here and... Um, I will leave you where you are They're right there, Miss Tammy, and you can just park it right there. It's fine. But I'd like for you to look at 1 Corinthians 11. I find this very significant because we find this in Paul's writing. But Paul wasn't there when this took place. You realize that? Paul was not there in the upper room. And yet the Lord's Supper is designed to be a blessing to the corporate body of believers as they come together and focus on their Savior and what He has done. Here Jesus is giving the guys, if you will, the inner circle, the disciples, an inward look about what is to take place. They were on the front row seat. I mean, it was a, it was a preview of what was to come. If you watch a movie, uh, if, if, if you... Uh, uh, rent a movie or whatever if you've gone to the movies uh, in your lifetime usually they show a preview of things to come here they had the inside edition if you will they were getting to look on the inside of what was about to take place and yet they didn't understand and that even in the midst of it they asked the question who's going to be the greatest is it me? And here in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, what we find is that Jesus rebuked the disciples in Matthew and in Luke, where we read as well, and you can even find it in Mark. What you find here is Paul rebuking the Corinth church. Here they're to be taking the Lord's Supper. They're to be observing the, the communion, uh, uh, um, the, the Lord's table, if you will, and yet they are abusing it, and Paul rebukes them. Paul says, look at verse 23, For I received the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. Hey guys, I, I didn't get this from anywhere else. God told me about it. Jesus Christ gave this to me. I wasn't there when this was started. He's letting you know, by authority of Jesus Christ, I'm sharing this with you. And notice that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. How interesting. And, and, and in verse 22, if you'd back up, he, he, he's letting them know, what have ye not houses to eat and drink in? I mean, they're making a mockery of this thing. They're making a big feast. They're getting, they're getting drunk. They're gorging themselves. They're even making fun of the poor that didn't have anything to bring. Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not, he says. Men, you're, you're making fun of those that are less fortunate. What should I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? What's those last few words? I praise you 
Come on, let's say it together. I praise. Hey, say it again. That is not the words you want God to say to you. That's not how you want to start. That is not the report card I want. You seem to be doing pretty good, but I can't praise you at all. And I'm going to tell you the Christian thing, the Christian world, the Christian life is not a game. It's not something to be faked. This is a real thing here. This is a real cause that we have for worth fighting for. This is something that we give our life to. This isn't something that we just attend. This is who we are. And Paul's like, man, you got the service together. You probably got people singing. Man, it looks like you got a good crowd tonight. They showed up. But it's all a joke. This is serious business. I mean, they got the Lord's table out there. I mean, they're taking communion. Hey, we're doing this for you, God. We're doing this for you, Jesus. In remembrance of you, Paul says, I don't think so. I can't praise you over this. You're missing it. Man, the rich were flaunting their wealth by being gluttons. They were being drunk in, in, in such an, a local assembly. And boy, this is a wonderful text that Paul shares with us. And, and what's really interesting is that Paul wasn't there when Christ met the twelve in the upper room, commonly known as the Last Supper. Maybe that's how it even references it in your Bible. I mean, this, this took place on the very night that Judas Iscariot betrayed Christ, and it was on the night before Christ would go to the cross. And I think of this, that, yeah, Paul was not there. And yet, he gives it predominantly to the Gentile church. I mean, after all, what was meant with them and, 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 and the disciples and the Jews, we get to, we're invited in on this. This was transferred over un, unto Paul's writing, who is an apostle to the Gentiles, and we get to see this and participate on this. And I kind of wonder, man, why was, why was Israel given the observance through the twelve? Why, why was Israel given this observance through the twelve disciples? And and how do we have it today through the Apostle Paul? Because we know that most of Israel's laws and commandments and observance were, were, are not even required of us. And I'm going to tell you why this is so, so significant to us today as it was in their day. The reason why the Lord's Supper was given to both Israel and the body of Christ is because of what it represents. It represents the cross work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. And, and, and it's important for us to keep that in mind that, that whether in Israel in the future or the body of Christ today, all of God's blessing flow directly uh, through the cross work of Jesus Christ. Now I want you to know that this Sunday when you come to church, come with your party hat on. Not literally, but spiritually, okay? Don't come with a party hat on, not physically. We ought to come with that mentality. And, and yes, we're going to talk about the cross, but I, I'm going to tell you, I, I'm not just going to focus on the cross. We want to know why Jesus is not on the cross. Can I hear an amen right there? And matter of fact, he's not even in the tomb. That's a big amen. We're going to focus on it all, but mostly that he is risen. It's a celebration that we're to have. And people were, are going to be focused on Easter egg hunts, and, and those have all their places, if you will, I guess. But my point is this. Hey, come Sunday, we're going to have a praiseworthy time here. We're going to have an exciting time, and we're going to observe what Christ has done, and we're going to remember what he's done, and we're going to celebrate that. Why? Because we can look back on the cross and see that we get nothing but blessings from what Christ has done. I'm the benefactor from it. I don't deserve it, but Christ gives it. 
What a blessing that is for us to be able to remember that. And every time you come to the Lord's Supper, and every time you come and you take a piece of bread and you take that cup, and every time we have a celebration, and every time that cross is mentioned, and every time that empty tomb is mentioned, and every time we sing about Christ, that He is risen, and our songs are going to be uh, driven towards that, and our invitation song is going to be, Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Thank you for the price you've paid for us. For giving up your life and dying to save the lost, thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Everything on Sunday is not about freedom. It's not about the guests. It's not about you. It's about Jesus Christ. And here in the Bible, we kind of give them a little slack a little bit. We kind of, a little flack, if you will. Uh, how could they miss it? I'm going to tell you something. We miss it sometimes. Sometimes we're not hitting on all cylinders. And the reason for that is, is we forget the most important part. And I want you to know that the Lord's Supper is a remembrance. Would you look at verse 24? Notice at the very end, this do in what? Oh yeah, you got it, remembrance. What does remembrance mean? What does it mean? Hello? The words in the, uh, there's a word that we have in remembrance. It's remember. Look at verse 25. Look at the last part of that. In remembrance of me. This is all about Jesus. You know what Jesus wants you to do? I want you to focus on me. I want you to remember. Now, if I have to be told to remember, I wonder if it's because I haven't been focusing on it and maybe I've lost track of it or maybe I have failed to recall it as I should. This do in remembrance of me. So what are we remembering? I'll tell you what we're remembering. We're remember, remembering that uh, of Christ's finished work on the cross. That's what the Lord's Supper is about. That's what communion is about. That's what the table is about. And that's exactly what Paul told the church. It is a remembrance. And boy, there's something in sinful mankind that wants to try to perform on outward action and, and, and try to perform something to receive God's favor. I mean, even the disciples are like, hey, Jesus is going to like this question. Ready? Let's, let's get him. Hey, Jesus, who's going to be the greatest? <laughs> you didn't think we were going to ask that one, did you? Man, I just had to grieve his heart. Jesus was all God. He was all man. I can only imagine how hard his heart must have hurt. Here in chapter 11 with the Apostle Paul, when this should have been a, a glorious occasion and a celebration, a, a celebratory event, here he comes to that, and they're, they're, they're laying around getting drunk and, and, and mocking the poor and, and being glutton, just feeding their face. And he just says, you know what? I, can't, I praise you not. And he, and he rebukes them. I mean, there are those who have such a, a weird a uh, 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 distorted view of what communion is and, w and what this is all about. I've mentioned it before, the transubstantiation view where, I mean, they hold the bread and juice um, in the Catholic faith. That is the actual blood and, and body of Jesus Christ. When someone prays over it, it literally becomes the, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ when it's uh, uh, institutionalized uh, uh, by the priest. Uh, some believe in uh, a consubstantiation, which is, that was developed by Martin Luther. And that, that, that views is that uh, uh, Christ's body and blood are, are truly present uh, uh, and under the blood, but they do not actually change into Christ's body and blood, uh, but, but Christ is present in the elements. So when, I go, when we go to the store, Christ is in Welch's grape juice? That doesn't make sense. We make up all kinds of stuff. It's not about the little cracker. It's not about the juice. It's about what the cracker and the juice represents. It's amazing how complicated religion can make things. It's amazing how we can get so many things 
twisted and turned. And, and, and I'll be honest with you, re religion loves mysterious uh, 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 things. It, 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 loves, it, it loves a good act, and, 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 it, and it loves things that are kind of spooky and, and unknown. But I want us to turn to Luke chapter 22, if we could. And I want us to clear away the fog. I want us to get the heart of our Savior. And I want us to see what He has to say about it. Luke 22. Luke 22. Look at verse 14. I'm going to read all the way through 21. All right, so Luke 22. Verses 14 through 21. Are you there? Say amen. Okay, if not, catch up. I'm going to start. All right, Luke 22. When the hour was come, he sat down, the twelve apostles with him, and he said to them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover which you with you before I suffer. And then we read, For I say unto you, I will not eat, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he takes the cup and, and he gives thanks for that. And he says, Take, eat. Divide it among yourselves. Take this and divide it among yourselves. And he tells them about the fruit of the vine. And I'm not going to drink this until, uh, until the kingdom of God shall come. Verse 19. And, and he took bread and he did the same thing there. Verse 20. Likewise also the cup after supper. Saying this cup is the New Testament. In my blood which is shed for you. And what's really interesting here is that Jesus is eating... The Passover meal with the twelve, right? You count that, right? He's eating, he's eating with them. And he holds up some bread, and he holds up some juice, and he gives it to them, and he tells them what it represents. Did you notice that? Uh, this bread, this, this is my body. And he, 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 he holds up the juice, and he says, this is my blood that's shed for you. Now, here's the thing. This has to be representative, and it has to be symbolic, and here's the reason why. Um, what's holding up the bread, and what's holding up the juice? All right, what's holding it up? You said Jesus. Can you be a little bit more? Is his toes holding it up? Is his ear? Huh? All right, so his, his body, his phalanges, his, his digits, his hands, uh, his appendages, if you will. I, he's holding it up. So if it's his body... Then how can he be holding it up? And here's the thing. Jesus is present with them. Have I lost anybody yet? All right, Jesus is with them, right? He's with them. Where's his blood at? So it can't be in the cup. It's in his body. And, and you know what? It can't be his literal blood because it's in his body. And it can't be his physical body because his body is what's holding the bread. And, and, and what's really interesting, look at um, John chapter 6. If you would, just go to the book there to the right. John 6. And look at verse 35. And he said unto them, here's a great statement. One of one of Jesus' several I am statements. Jesus said, used the phrase and uh, started off some sentences with the words I am. And he made a lot of those, several of those, if you will. And here's one of them. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh uh, to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Now, here's what's really interesting. These verses really make it clear that eating and drinking of Christ is coming to Him and believing on Him. See, here, here's the thing. This is really odd because to say that this is literally His body, to eat Christ's flesh literally would be cannibalism. And to drink His blood would be contrary to the law of Moses. So it can't be any of those things. My point is this. It is a remembrance of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And we are always to take the Bible literally unless there is some obvious symbolic uh, 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 reasoning there. And that's obviously what this is. And, 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 and when we, we speak this way all the time, and I get it. We sit in church and say, boy, pastor, 
I'm burning up in here. Well, you're not literally burning up, are you? Or I'm freezing in here. Well, you're not literally freezing. Some of, some of you say, and, and, and you, probably, you say this a lot probably, when I leave the church, I really ha- I got to fly home. I, I, mean, I, I got to fly to the grocery store. I, I, I got to fly home and get the pot roasters on. Or, or I, I got to fly to Clarence's. I got to beat the crowd or whatever the case may be. Well, you're not really flying there. Right? So we're used to that. That's not what this is. Jesus is absolutely speaking in a symbolic form to represent something. It is so obvious that Jesus is speaking symbolically of his body and his blood when he held up the bread and the cup. Only religion can confuse all this. And clearly the bread and juice are meant to represent something. It is a remembrance, and it's a reminder of something. You know, the broken bread is to remind us that Christ's broken body, it's his body that was broken that he gave to be mutilated and that hung on a tree for you. You know that should have been your cross. And he took that cross for you. Those thorns that were placed on his head, those were yours. The lashes on his back, they belonged to you. You were guilty. But yet they did that to him, our sinless one, the sinless Savior. That's what they did. The fruit of the vine, the juice, if you will, is to remind us of the blood that he shed and gave for our redemption. There is no redemption without the shedding of blood. The Lord's Supper is a remembrance, simple and pure. It cannot bring you any kind of divine blessing, favor, or grace. And no, that, that, it can't do that because here's the thing. You and I already possess all the blessings and all the favor and all the grace uh, because we have that in Christ. We don't get that from a juice or a piece of bread. Bible reminds us even in Colossians 2.10 that we're complete in Christ. See, it's a reminder that you and I have received and we're partakers of Christ and, and that all the spiritual blessings that we possess are due to the finished and completed work of the cross on the Christ. Here, on the cross. Here's the thing. When Christ went to the cross and when he gave his life and when he rose again the third day, all those blessings, all that power, all the divinity of Jesus Christ, the moment that you trusted him as your Lord and Savior was imparted unto you. And so when you come on Sunday, guess what? Come with that feeling. Come with that on your mind. Come realizing, man, everything I'm singing about, everything I'm hearing today has been given to me because of what he has done, not because of anything I've done. You haven't done any of it to deserve it. But you are a recipient of it. And when you come to Jesus and you believe in Him, on Him, you become one with Jesus. The Bible says that the moment that we're saved, that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, according to Ephesians 5.30. The fact is, you are in Christ. You are in Christ. For anything else to be meaningful of the Lord's Supper or communion or the table, if it would have any other significant meaning, if it would have to be uh, something that we would have to partake of to be literally one with Christ's body or to take in His blood, uh, um, then I've got to be honest with you, then why did Christ have to go to the cross? Why not just eat some bread and have some juice? And if that's the case, and, and, and that would mean that if, if this is something that we've got to do to have that impartation, then it would mean that we didn't get all of Christ when we got saved. That literally means we would only have gotten part of Him. You understand that? So I need to take this physical food so I can get the rest of Him. I need to drink this juice so I can get the rest of Him. No, all that does is keep you coming back for more and more and 
more. That's not what it's about. When you believe on Christ, you became a member of His body. You became one with Him. Here's what's interesting. The Bible says that you are in Christ and Christ is in you. Look at Colossians chapter 1 and look at verse 2. You are in Christ and Christ is in you. Look at Colossians chapter 1. This is so amazing. I love this. Colossians 1. And look at... uh, Look at Colossians chapter 1, and then look at verse 27. We'll look at verse 2, then we'll look at verse 27. How about that? Colossians 1, verse 2. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ. Did you notice that? To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. I mean, these were real people. These were people who were believers. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery, among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Guess what I have in me? Take a wild guess. You got it. If you're saved, guess what you have in you? You have Christ. This is who we are. And I want you to know that when we, when we observe the Lord's Supper and when we celebrate this and, 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 and when we come to this, this is not only a time to remember what Christ has done on the cross through that finished work there, but it's also a, it's an outward demonstration of our faith in Christ. What's interesting, if you'd go back to 1 Corinthians really quick, because we're out of time, look at 1 Corinthians 11. And I'd like for you to look at verse 26. Obviously, in verse 24 and 25, we see the words remembrance. We are remembering something. We are recollect, recollecting something. We are focusing on what took place and the significance of that. But would you look at verse 26? I love this. I've mentioned this before, but for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, Ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Notice this phrase, ye do show. Did you notice that? Did you notice that church? Hello. Paul told the church when they partake and when they celebrate what Christ has done, that they show the Lord's death till he comes. That word show means to proclaim. Guess what we're going to do this Sunday? We're going to proclaim something. We're going to proclaim what we believe. We're going to proclaim that we know Christ as our Savior and that we believe this book and we believe in the death and the burial of Jesus Christ, but we also believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we're going to celebrate it and we're going to sing it and we're inviting you to be a part of that. And uh, listen, we're not here to irritate you. We're, we're not here to make you upset. But, but I'm telling you, we're here and we're inviting you to be here because we have something to share with you, and that is it's good news because we're going to show what Christ has done, so we're going to proclaim His worthiness and His glory today. That's what worship is. It's proclaiming and giving value to something that's worth. And that's what we're doing. And uh, that word uh, show also means, uh, translated in other parts of the Bible, it means to preach or declare. I kind of wonder this. As a Christian, what are you preaching? What are you declaring? What are you showing? How are you living? Are you proclaiming that you are in Christ and that Christ is in you? Are you proclaiming that you believe that Christ went to Calvary and that you are a partaker of Him? See, we are declaring that we believe in the cross work of Jesus Christ. We believe that Jesus bore our sins on the cross and that he shed his blood to provide for our forgiveness that saves us and provides complete salvation. Say, preacher, is this a warm-up for Sunday? You're preaching to the choir. Hey, the choir needs to hear it. 
And I'm saying to you that it is a warm-up. And I'm just trying to get you prepared for Sunday that when you come in, uh, leave the sour look on your face out there. Come in here and be ready to receive a blessing and be excited about it. And the music may be loud and you may not particularly care for this or particularly care for that, but I can guarantee you this, Christ will be exalted. And so all those preconceived things you have or your preferences, leave them at the door, but come in here and raise the banner for Jesus Christ and make some noise when you come in here and let your neighbor know that I'm here to proclaim Jesus Christ and, and I'm going to sing loud and I'm going to shout amen and man you be praying that people come and that they will receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and that they recognize that what Christ did on the cross is enough for them and that he saved you and that you're here proclaiming and showing that till he comes again and Paul says that every time that we do this Every time that we come together, this is what we're doing. This is why we do what we do. And, and, and Paul is letting us know that, that we are to declare these things. And, and it's not something weird. The fact is, he leaves it off with, in verse 26, you do show this, you show this till he come. And, 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 and Paul says we, we do this until he comes. And the fact is, is that we celebrate what Christ is doing. Even now, yes, what he's do, done on the cross. But you know that work isn't done? What he did on the cross is finished. Stay with me. But Christ isn't done with saving lives. Christ isn't finished with that work. Christ is still wanting to impact your family. Christ is still wanting to impact the life of your neighbor. Christ is still wanting to get that old drunkard sober. Christ is still wanting to get that old boy hooked that's on pornography, off of pornography, so he can live a pure life mentally and physically. And it is a spiritual battle. And all of those are. And he's wanting to get that that mom who is wavered uh, and that may be raising her son or daughter as a single mom. He wants to know that their significance is found in him and that he's enough for them. See, God, through his son, Jesus Christ, uh, he's the remedy for all. This is a one size fit all deal. There's nobody too good or too bad for Jesus. Jesus is just wanting us to get them to come so that the gospel can be presented to them so that they will have an opportunity to respond. I'm going to tell you what we got to do. We got to make sure we're obedient with what God's asked us to do. We don't save anybody. That's not our responsibility. That's not what we do. Our responsibility is to invite and to proclaim. Let's go tell them. Let's go reach them. And let's invite them to come in and listen to the message. Let's, let's, let's do that. Hey, we've got a message of hope for you on Easter Resurrection Day. And here's the good thing. It's not a memorial service. <laughs> We're not celebrating the dead. We want you to know that he's alive. And he's well. He's at the right hand of the Father. Man, what he did, he did for you. And he'll straighten that crooked path you've got and you're walking on. He'll straighten it out if you'll let him. That's where you've got to be humble about it. I'm going to tell you, that's the message they need to hear. But I'm going to tell you, our part is prepping beforehand to get them here. So folks, when you come, they come with a celebration on your heart. Come with a celebration in your spirit. And come ready to worship. And come ready, hey, to greet those guests. And listen, I love you. God bless you. I love you. Come on, say it back. I know that was hard for some of you, but get over it, all right? I love some of you, but listen, when them guests here on Sunday quit trying to greet everyone that you already know. Stop doing that. You tell whoever's trying to get in your way to greet you, just tell them, hey, I'll get with you after service. 
Don't even give them your hand. I'll get you out of the service and tuck it. Because they're still going to put that hand out there. And if they get it, they're not going to let go of it. And you make a beeline for that guest. And man, I mean, you can talk to all the other people that you know before or after service. But on Sunday, you make it a big deal for that guest. Man, thank God you're here. Woo, it's so good to meet you. And if they say, I've been coming for 20 years, you just say, what's well, about time we met? Don't make it awkward. But you better not walk all the way over here and all the way over there. And bypass that guest and not make them feel welcome here. Good night. It may be someone that we knocked on a door to. And God forbid that they come to this church and we want to give them the gospel. And the first thing before it's ever sung, the song is ever sung, before the message is ever preached, they get to the fellowship time and no one made them feel welcome. You think they're going to sit and listen to a man? You think they're going to believe anything we say after that point? Of course not. Now I'm saying to you, Get out of your comfort zone, okay? Stop greeting those that you know each and every Sunday and purposely mark that guest where they are. And when they raise their hand, you because every one of you rubbernecking to see who's getting the gift now during the service. So just go ahead and rubberneck it and turn yourself around and, and, and look at them. And then as soon as, man, I say fellowship time, because this week uh, I'm not doing fellowship time right behind greeting guests. So you're going to have to mark it. You're going to have to wait on it. So we're going to sing a song right before you fellowship. But before we sing that song, it's going to be Greek time. So you're going to have to remember where they are. But as soon as we, we fellowship time, man, you've got to get right to them. Hey, thank you for coming. Hey, how'd you, how'd you get here today? Not by way of transportation, but man, how were you invited here? Man, you ought to ask that question. I'm going to tell you why you ought to ask it. You ought to find out, especially if you're one of those that's been praying and knocking on doors. Hey, I want to know why you came. What brought you here? Y'all came to my house. Man, that's good. That's good. God wanted you here today. Man, I can't wait to see you after the service. Hey, do you have anybody to sit with? See, those are the things we need to do. Hey, do you have anybody to sit with? Do you even know where the bathrooms are? I mean, good night. I mean... We get so used on, on, on ourselves and knowing what, who everyone is and all that. I'm saying to you, hey, let's make this Sunday a big deal. This is a big deal. Th this is our banner. This is why we're here. And this is the greatest day of the year. This is it. Hey, let's not squander it. If we're going to go knock on those doors, if we're going to pray we're going to preach this and we're going to plan off of this. Hey, let's put it all together. So every one of you need to be greeters this, year, this week. Every one of you, put a smile on your face. Ladies, I mean, I mean, paint the barn if you have to. I mean, whatever you got to do. And man, let's put our best out there. Guys, hey, wear your best this week. Look, uh, look sharp. Hey, get some sleep the night before. Don't stay up late. I mean, just why? Sunday's coming. Sunday's coming. I will be purposely doing things this weekend after I go out and knock on doors that I'm going to do things this weekend so I am not distracted, discouraged, or defeated before Sunday morning. Say, what's that? I'm not going to let you get a hold of me. I, I'm not answering the phone. You don't don't come. By. Why? I, I, I don't want to see anybody before Sunday morning uh, except the class. And I'm, te I'm, I'm going to tell you why. I don't want Satan to get one inch before I get up here. Why? And you shouldn't either. Man, you shut her down early on Saturday. Why? It's important. Make it a big deal. And by the way, you that are teachers in here, you ought to get your class on board. You ought to call somebody tonight, tomorrow, Friday, say, hey, look, the pal boy, the pastor challenged us on this, and man, I'm for it. Man, man let's, let, let, let's be energized on Sunday. Now, let's not be wiping the eye boogers off, you know, come 1030. Hey, let's be wide awake. Let's, let, let's drink, drink an energy hot shot five before you come here. I don't care, double shot espresso. Do what you got to do. 
but come here ready and wound up to celebrate this book and to celebrate our Savior. Okay? Are you with me? Amen? All right. I, 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 God deserves our best. And, and I'm going to tell you something. He gave me his best. And, and I want to... I want to be found faithful. And I sure don't want that to be said. I praise you not. I praise you not. Jesus, all this is about you. This is why we do this. If not, let's, let, let's go find something else to do. I'm telling you, this is, this is a celebration for us. And so let's close in a word of prayer. Father, I just pray tonight that we'll be mindful of your goodness in your redeeming power through the cross. And God, I pray that we will be coming expecting and excited and ready for Sunday. And God, we don't come in kind of half uh, way and just kind of crossed or, uh, Lord, we're just kind of thinking of other stuff. But we are just preparing for Saturday and knocking on some doors and we just are feeding ourselves spiritually, and we're getting ready for what you're going to do. Because, God, we know and we expect that when your word is preached and when your word is taught and when your name is exalted, you said when I am lifted up that I will draw all men to myself. And so, God, we have a responsibility. And I, I pray that we will do nothing that would quench your spirit. We will do nothing that will get in the way you being at work and God that we will just man we, we will put a, aside the cares for Monday and maybe the issues that came on Friday and we all have them and, and God I just pray that man that evening of Saturday after uh, we're tired and we've, we've eaten a good dinner or whatever the case may be we just we're just contemplating and praying God be at work here at church tomorrow pray for every one of those houses and those faces God, may you imprint those faces that we see on Saturday on our heart. God, that those people will come, that we'll connect with them, and that Jesus on Sunday, that if they don't know Jesus, if they don't know you, they will come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. They will repent unto God and turn in faith to you, and that they will believe in the finished and completed work of the cross. God, may we be a people that are prepared and, God, that are ready. And God, may we just be expecting that because we have been planning for that and praying for it. God, may you just show yourself mightily this coming Sunday. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, it's late. Let's take the offering and then we'll go.